He had done he had he had done everything he could in the United States and outside of the Philippines. He had uh, rallied the opposition. He had spoken against Marcos. He had testified before Congress, um, and there was nothing more he could do. So he felt that it was it was he really had to go home. Yeah, I told Nino. I really honestly feel, Nino, you know, that uh, when you alight from the plane, you will be shot. And there was a moment of silence, and then Nino you know, looks at me, and he says, even if I were placed in a box, I would still go home, because the Filipinos are worth dying for. I told him, Nino, you, know, you suffered for seven years and seven months in prison, and I think you've suffered enough for your country. Why should you suffer more? I wrote Mr. Marcos and I told him that while I have vowed never to enter the political arena again, I shall dedicate the last drop of my blood to the restoration of freedom and the dismantlement of your martial law. Do not forget that your readiness to suffer will light the torch of freedom which can never be put out. And learn to say no, no to tyranny, no to corruption, no to all this degradation of human dignity. The moment you say no, you're beginning to protest. The moment you say no to tyranny, you're beginning to struggle, the long, lonely road to freedom. Nick Joaquin organized Aquino's family history around three generations of people who defied authority. Ninoy's grandfather, Sevillano Aquino, fought the colonial power Spain and its successor, the United States of America. Sevillano was a rebel, a national hero, and for a time, a political prisoner. in Aquino's hometown in Tarlac province. It was grandfather Sevillano Aquino who erected a statue to the Philippine national hero, Jose Rizal, who was executed by the Spanish for his opposition to their tyranny. Rizal looks out on a town square that is named for Sevillano's most acclaimed son, Ninoy's father, Don Benigno Aquino Sr., an ardent nationalist. During America's colonial rule of the Philippines, when other politicians clung to the idea of a second-class affiliation with the United States, Benigno Sr. campaigned vigorously for total independence. When Japan completed its invasion of the Philippines in 1942, Benigno Sr., under pressure to soften the blow of invasion, was taken in by Japan's promise of an Asia for Asians. As the fortunes of Japan's military suffered, so did Benigno Aquino's reputation. He was imprisoned by the victorious Americans, then paroled to await trial on charges of collaborating with the enemy. In the company of his namesake, Benigno Jr., he suffered a heart attack. Ninoy told Nick Joaquin, when the Americans came back, Papa was all of a sudden a collaborator. Those who I thought were my friends began to shun me. When he died, I thought my world had ended. I began to distinguish between night and day sorrow and laughter. Determined to recoup the family's name, Aquino started to work on the Manila Times at 15 as a copy boy. He ate, slept, and showered at the newspaper, and at odd hours, he became a copy writer. Uh, I think he started as a messenger boy, and uh, they asked for volunteers of 
reporters to go to Korea and nobody volunteered, so he volunteered. He was uh, 17 years old. He took his own photographs and became known in the press corps as Aquino, the milk boy. He said Korea aged him 10 or 20 years. It gave me the fatalism that's with me to this day. Do your job and hope tomorrow will be another day. And if tomorrow doesn't come, that's it. Returning to the Philippines, Ninoy Aquino struck out into the mountains to interview the most renowned peasant rebel of the island of Luzon, Luis Taruk. Through a series of meetings, Aquino became the conduit for Taruk's surrender, a national event that made Aquino a national figure. He described Taruk as one of the few men who impressed him in youth. He never talked to me of communism. He talked of the poor in this country. He opened my eyes to the inequities in my own hometown. I thought to myself, this is the first Christian I have met. The same year, aged 21, he courted and married Corazon Cofanco a deeply religious, American-educated offspring of the largest landowners in Tarlac province. The president, Ramon Magsaysay, gave Aquino a medal and enlisted him as an advisor, aide and confidant. At President Magsaysay's urging, Aquino returned with Corazon to his family's house in Concepcion and ran for mayor. Bewildered by the ferocity of the opposition campaigns, Ninoy Aquino, for once in his life, thought of quitting. He was curled up in bed and said, I don't want to do this anymore. I just don't want to do this anymore. And my mom just, I think my mom had a terrific influence on him. He says, no, you've got to get up here and campaign. My mother, in trying to convince him to continue the, the fight, I think first applied her motherly authority. When that didn't work, she applied uh, feminine tears. When that didn't work, she applied pride that uh, even in cockfighting, you don't run away, you go down fighting. Ninoy found his voice knew exactly the pulse of the audience, when to crack the joke, when to touch their heart, when you draw an applause, because people just go to hear him. He can talk for, uh, not hours, for days, if given the chance. He called himself a radical rich guy, first as a mayor, then vice governor and governor of his province. He promoted land reform, equal access to public education, and social welfare. Charles Avila was then a young democratic socialist who had left the priesthood for a life of activism, inspired by the social vision of Pope John XXIII. When I first met him, he was rich, he was powerful, but he was a good man who was going to do I wanted to do good things for the people. It's the peaceful revolution, I think, that is what he was uh, looking for. Because there's no victory in war. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was in prison and you visited me. I was a stranger and you took me in, etc. With what do you feed the hungry man, we would ask. Huh? With mere words or with rice? And how much does rice cost? <laughs> And uh, where are you getting the money? All the questions he asked me were oriented to what was the common good to the people. Of course, 
Sino yung magsay? He knew you were a seminarian. What did you expect? So be it. But that was the impression I got. Aquino had one hand in the province, one hand in the national capital. Almost daily, he traveled the 60 miles to Manila to serve President Mixaizai and his successors, Presidents Garcia and Macapagal, all of whom predicted that Aquino would in time be president. Their successor, Ferdinand Marcos, took a less kindly view. Marcos hated him, uh, as people used to say, because he saw himself in Ninoy. Marcos undercut Aquino's social programs in Tarlac and accused Aquino of being a communist or in league with communists. After four increasingly repressive years of the Marcos presidency, in 1967, Aquino ran nationwide for a seat in the Senate of the Philippines. And he won. His admirers in the press called him Superboy. Every one of us knew him because he had a long background in journalism. We knew his bride, we knew he belonged to the right family, we know he talked fast, sharp, and being journalist, you said, I, we have to watch this guy. When Inouye was in the Senate, um, he uh, was uh, actively involved in a lot of government exposés. Uh, for irregularities and corruption and abuses that not only involved the president but even Imelda Marcus also at the time. And, and so uh, Ninoy poised himself as the only really serious threat to, to the presidency. There was almost an assumption that he would be president. He was the leader of his opposition party and um, it was an assumption that the way the party swung back and forth it would be his turn soon. Events intruded the United States, confidently relying on anti-communist methods developed by the CIA in the Philippines, escalated its war in Vietnam. Marcus promised his countrymen to stay out of the Vietnam War, but then made a deal with the U.S. President Lyndon Johnson. He sent Filipino soldiers to Vietnam in return for more arms more money. Students in the Philippines protested the war and also Marcus's corruption of the ballot box in what became known as the first quarter storm. Some joined Marxist rebels who regrouped in the countryside under the banner of the New People's Army. Poverty was rampant. Corruption abounded. I said to him, Ferdy, in as long as you're working for the country, you can count on me 100%. Mr. President, I said, you know, your salary is not enough to keep uh, a man in your position. I'll tell you what I'll do for you, I said. I will give you 20 million pesos a year, tax paid. And he said to me, how will you raise the money? Well, I said, you know, in the tobacco business, uh, we have to mix Virginia tobacco with local brands. I said, the manufacturers would happily pay me one peso or 150 a kilo of this tobacco. That is the money. I will pay the tax on it. I will pay the income on it. And then we'll turn over the money to you. No no strings attached. You don't have to do anything for us. Because you know that's a very good idea. Okay. Then he turned over the idea to his group of people. So they started bringing in the tobacco, they brought in sardines, they brought in apples, they brought in everything you could think of and levied on it and made money. So that maybe I was partially to blame. No? 